This is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and you can find us on YouTube and Facebook. And I'm here today with Tony Ardizzone, who is the author of several books and a short story writer. He's been writing for many, many years. So welcome, Tony. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank you. It's uh, an honor to be invited to your show. I'm oh, really thank you. No, the honor is all mine, believe me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I certainly want to talk about the, the your writing and everything. But before we do that, uh, I think you grew up on the north side of Chicago in an Italian neighborhood. Is that right? Well, we grew. Yes, I grew up uh, on the north side of Chicago. We lived on we lived in flats um, on Webster Avenue in the, what is now the Deep Hall area. We lived on the corner of Fullerton and Southport. Um, which now I think is a fast food restaurant. It was across the street from the currency exchange. And uh, then my parents, my father was able to afford a house um, in what was called Edgewater. I guess it's now Andersonville, around near Bryn Mawr and Clark. Uh, so uh, we're North Siders, loyal Cub, Cubs fans, and uh, cursed, cursed with... <laughs> cursed with being cursed with 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 the Chicago Cubs. Um, uh, if I, I can tell you a little bit that uh, my father's um, my father's side of the family is from Sicily. His uh, parents were born in Menfi. And one of the stories about his father is that uh, his one of the reasons his father Vito Artizoni came to the Americas was to avoid conscription into the Italian army. Though when he got here, for some reason, he ended up fighting in World War I regardless, but on the side of, on the, side of the Americans. Um, he was sickly and often spent, was forced to spend time in a tuberculosis sanitarium. Uh, my father and um, his mother, two sisters and his younger brother, um, who sadly was on the uh, autistic spectrum. They lived in the projects uh, and they were part of uh, St. Philip at Easy's parish. Uh, so that's where we probably would have lived had um, the city not uh, essentially rezoned and destroyed that, that area. Um, so they were part of the, the near North side uh, Italians. Um, my father didn't speak English until he went to grammar school uh, because his father they were on they were on welfare. Um, uh, the story is is that uh, pretty much it from the age of eight and on he was responsible for uh, to bring home to bring home money. He sold newspapers in Grant Park, wow. and then later that led to his his lifelong uh, second or third job of selling newspapers. Uh, we had, um, he had five stands around the Union Station on Canal. We had a stand in front of Cafe Bohemia. We had uh, uh, one in, in, outside of Florsheim Shoes. Uh, and he also, on the weekends, back when there was uh, <clears throat> uh, theaters and movies, he would sell the Sunday paper on Saturday nights. Um, he worked since the age of eight, and I'm, uh, I got to say, I'm proud that when I was eight, he needed me, and against my mother's wishes, it was a, a winter evening, that's when I began, he took me on Saturday night, um, and I, 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 had to, I had to stand by a, one of the newsstands, uh, he said, don't do anything, if they rob you, let them, you know, um, I made a lot of tips, my mother put me in so many clothes, I could hardly move my arms. Um, but we, we, it was a lifelong activity. And throughout my whole life, um, I and my brothers helped him uh, with the newsstands. And that was a lot, that basically uh, the newspapers um, were able, were allowed us, allowed him, uh, our family, we had five kids, allowed him to then uh, be able to put down money on a mortgage on a house. Wow, uh, fantastic. Yeah, that's fantastic. So wow. 
as far as as far as my Italian American experience, it was solely with my father's family, and my mother. Um, my mother didn't speak Italian. My mother. Uh, there's some question. Well, we didn't know when we were growing up, but she was born out of wedlock, raised by grandparents. They were pretty stern and pretty mean. Um, they were uh, French speaking Germans. I think the mother was born in Alsace. Hmm. And it was always something I always thought, well, I never felt really, we never felt really comfortable. There were five of us in the family. And I always thought, well, they don't like us because we're Italian. Or maybe we're too noisy, or maybe, you know, maybe there's some other reason. I always felt very comfortable at my Nana's, um, at Nana's house. Um, she lived with the uh, the younger of my uh, father's two sisters. And I was, I had a blessed position because he was the oldest son, and I was the oldest son of the oldest son. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I could do no wrong, you know. And I soon learned with uh, with my, my my wonderful aunts, his sister's, Eva and Guillermo, we called Guillermo May. Eva and May, Eva was a fantastic, a fantastic cook and baker. She was my godmother. May, not so good, but they bring out the cookies and I knew enough to say, oh, what happened? Who went to the bakery? And then <laughs> May would say, Nana, did you hear what little, to what little Tony said? He wants to know, he wants to know who went to the bakery. And then I would say, Miss Ski, you know, and then, and then I would say, oh, and they say, try them, try them. And I knew whose was whose. And I would, of course, praise them to the, you know, praise them to the heavens. Oh, this is so delicious. I can't, but someone made these, you made these. So, so I knew, I knew how to, I knew how to put a smile on their face. That's that's a great story. Yeah, you know, we I grew up like that too with all my aunts cooking and everything. But but a couple of things on what you said was my um my grandfather well before I do that, my favorite, because I used to work for Chase, I used to go to Chicago a lot. I know exactly what you mean by uh, you know, Grand Park and and the station, because one of our office buildings was just like two blocks from from the from the station. Mm -hmm. Um but my probably one of my all-time favorite restaurants, which I know is, I think is gone now, uh, was Rose Angeles. Mm. Um, and uh, it was in a, it was in a house basically on a, on a, you know, regular street. And uh, they converted the, the downstairs of the house into a restaurant and it was, it was fabulous. Uh, but my, um, my uh, mom's parents came because my grandfather had fought in the Lib Libyan war in I guess 1911 or something like that, and when World War One was breaking out, uh, she said, "You're not going to fight in another. You're not going to leave again. You have, you know, he had, at that time I think they had two children, and so they came to America uh, because um, I, th I think um, my brother, my grandmother's brother, or my grandfather's brother was here, um, but I fully think they want they plan to go back because they had left my uncle there. Yeah, um, so." you know, uh, interesting. And I have a little bit of a newspaper background in that my dad was a photographer for the daily news in New yeah. York city. Um, but I have to ask you, so now your, your father was born here. Yeah. Yes. But he yes. didn't speak, he didn't speak English until he went to school. Right. No. And, and, and so what year was he born? Uh, 1921. So right about the same age as my dad, 23. Yeah. 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 And um, I met his friends. I would meet his friends at uh, at weddings and they would talk about uh, they would talk. I would ask all the questions I could about my father. My father was a very my father was a very hardworking man. He was a little anxious. And later, um, some years later, I gave I gave a reading and I was part of a um an Italian American Writers Festival at Triton College, and my father, my parent, my father and mother came, and my father actually stood up and said that he had to confess that when he was a child, um, he felt quite ashamed and embarrassed um, about being poor, about taking the wagon to the armory to pick up the food, um, the welfare food, the you know the cheese and the the white butter with the little dye packets or something. Um, 
and that he he was not comfortable um, being Italian, but all of his friends were, and I think that they were they were part of a community, um, and um, you know he later. Um, I mean, he never changed his name. He didn't hide yeah. anything. But um, I think he knew that it wasn't necessarily an advantage in a city as, um, can I say this, a city as Irish um, as Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, yeah. uh, I lived uh, when I, I, I went to school at the University of Illinois. Um, and when I came, I, I lived in Chicago for two years afterwards. Then I, I moved into, I, I got a place on uh, Taylor Street. So I lived in the Taylor Street back when there were still parts of, um, this was 1971, when there were still parts of the old neighborhood that was being um, torn down. I think Mike Royko wrote really well about this. Um, uh, the betrayal of uh, the alderman Vito Marzullo, who diligently delivered every vote in the world for Daly, for the Daly machine, and then Daly's decision to put Circle University of Illinois Chicago to put circle right in that neighborhood and basically rezone that neighborhood. When I was still living there, there were restaurants that were in houses and mm -hmm. then things would be rezoned and then things would close. And I can remember going to, uh, I lived down the block from uh, Mario's uh, Italian ice stand, which was a wonderful place to live in, in the summer. You could just walk, I could walk down the front, the front steps, go down a block and a half and I would be, you know, join the crowds in front of Mario's and get a lemon ice. Uh, what a, what a gift. Um, but I could, I could see the transition. I could see the changing, uh, the change of the, of the neighborhood. Um, it's part of the, I don't know if there was a conspiracy or a decision, but um, at some point people will look back and they'll talk about Italians in Chicago and they'll talk about how the city uh, essentially did not enable or help the neighborhoods to stay in the city, so that many then many Italians then moved uh, moved to the suburbs. Well, and, and that's you know that's not so much different than it was in in New York. You know, we grew up in Corona, Queens, and um, funny you mentioned lemon ice because um, I don't know if you ever watched The King of Queens on television, um, but there's a scene at the end of the the you know the the opening where he walks away with the lemon ice and he drops it. Well, yeah. that was like that was our lemon ice place because that was like four blocks from my grandmother's house. Uh, oh, wow. And when we had a party, we would get like a five gallon lemon ice. Yeah. Um, and the funniest thing about that lemon ice stand was you could only have one flavor at a time. You you, you couldn't ask for like you know strawberry and lemon. You had you could have lemon or you could have strawberry, but you yeah. weren't allowed to mix. It was like it was like the soup Nazi. You know? <laughs> so you couldn't no, ask for two. So you couldn't ask for one 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 of each. No, you couldn't ask oh. for a, you couldn't ask for a scoop of one and a scoop of another in the okay. same. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> Wasn't allowed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was great lemon ice because he made everything with fresh fruit. I mean, it was really oh. like if you got blueberry, it was there were real blueberries in there. Oh, I don't I don't know. It's in this heat. Um, boy, I I it's. It's a wonder why it's a wonder why um, they haven't uh, commercialized it and why it's not common all over. Um, well, but you know when they do that, it's not the same anyway. You exactly. Know, they, exactly. They, they, yeah. they start taking shortcuts and they change yeah. the ingredients and that has yeah. the name, but it's it's not going to taste like the original lemon ice. But uh, you know, I I I used to I had one girl working for me from Chicago. Uh, Khadidra and um, we were in New York City one time in Little Italy which is practically gone by now but there was a little small little bakery there and uh, I said uh, I said come come with me you, you have to go in we have to go in here she says why I said we're gonna go inside I'll tell you why when we get inside so we get inside and I said this is what I smelled when I was growing up uh, yeah. this is the way it smelled and she says you're kidding. I said, no, this is we this is the way it smelled in an Italian bakery when I was growing up. Uh and you know what people don't they don't know that experience, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um it's it's truly the case. And I I can remember now that you now that you talk about it, I can remember 
um, all the occasions at Nana's house, um, the smells in the kitchen. And then I would go down the hallway and I'd go into the front room and the men would be sitting around the TV, you know, with the rabbit ears, with the aluminum foil on top, watching whatever game was on. Um, nobody smoked. Um, so there was not much of a smell there, but then I would go down the hall and then, uh, uh, go in the kitchen and listen to the women and they were, they would just be, uh, cooking and working um how it was it was truly wonderful yeah and and you know this and i was said this the other day the stuff that will come out of those kitchens and the heat no air conditioning and they would be there all day all day absolutely, uh, absolutely. Paul, that's all i have to ask you so growing up like that i'm sure you had some non-italian friends that you brought home for for dinner uh or to nona's house what was what was that what was their experience when they saw all that food oh they they were amazed um <laughs> my and my mother did her very best to cook the meals that um eva and may would give her though they would remind her that she never could get it quite right <laughs> um i should go back and say that according to the stories my father was supposed to marry carmela Carmela's family lived in the projects. She was half Sicilian, half Mexican. And they could read and write. So they were the scribes for mm -hmm. people. They would write letters and they would read letters. Uh, both of my grandparents uh, were illiterate. Um, and I often told my mother, I say, you know, if he had married Carmela, I'd be able to speak Italian. And... <laughs> Maybe some Spanish. When I was in high school, I took Spanish. Uh, and I said, and I, I I, I could be bilingual, trilingual. And she would say, but then you wouldn't be here. And I'd say, no, Ma, I'd still be here. She said, oh, she said, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like Carmela. She sends us cards from California. You should see her. Um, right now, she's as big as a house. And she would, <laughs> there would be a picture of lovely, this lovely tanned woman in a muumuu. And indeed, she was... Um, um, she was a beautiful woman, um, but I would I would joke with my mother um, about that. There's a story about my mother um, that they never <clears throat> they never cease telling. Um, one that my mother really didn't like. Um, Nana said uh, told my mother that she should get, bring her the eggs for the pupikulovi. So my mother then got a dozen eggs. Said, How many do you need? She said, a dozen. So my mother got a dozen eggs and gave it to her. Um, no one told her that they should be hard boiled. So, <laughs> so, so, so when they made the poopy galovi, they discovered that, that, she hadn't, that she hadn't hard boiled the eggs. But uh, the, the friends' reactions were that they were extremely impressed with the food and particularly Aunt Eva's. Eva would feed the neighborhood. Um, and she could make a plate of uh, a pasta with uh, uh, lem simple lentils. Mm -hmm. And she said that the, 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 the kids were just the kids would just go crazy uh, and, and, and enjoy and love, and love the food. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I miss those certainly miss those days. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about your, um, your writing, your, prolific. Uh, you've written many books, many short stories. And in fact, I think you just had a book released recently, correct? Yeah, I, uh, the book is called In Bruno's Shadow. Here's a copy. Um, a uh, pub uh, publishing company in Canada, Guernica Editions, that publishes a lot of work by uh, uh, both Canadians and North Americans, as well as Italians, people of Italian, uh, of Italian descent. Uh, and Bruno's Shadow was set in Rome uh, during the, uh, uh, the months prior to the death of uh, John Paul II and has a sequence of stories, interconnected stories of both Americans and Italians um, in Rome at that time. A lot of description of Rome itself. Um, some of the readers have said that uh, it's a, a marvelous trip to Rome, and it certainly, uh, I think, if you go, if you get a copy and you read it in an air-conditioned home, it might be a less, <laughs> a little bit more pleasant than right now. I read that what is it? Rome is 112 degrees. 
Fahrenheit. Um, uh, in the book, um, there's a variety of characters. What I tried to do was I went to Rome in search of ideas for a book and then realized that I could find the ideas if I just simply observed uh, the, the art. Uh, there's a lot in here about Bernini's statues. Um, there's a character, a performing artist who, uh, a street artist who imitates Caravaggio, dresses like Caravaggio and then performs different scenes from Caravaggio's life. There's a scene where he's in a restaurant and he 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 rigged it so that uh, the waiter brings him the plate of artichokes. This is the story where uh, Caravaggio asks if the artichokes were cooked with butter or oil, and the waiter says, "You taste them." And then Caravaggio threw the threw the dish of artichokes at the waiter, and then there was a tumble and a fight. So um, what I what I tried to do was to recreate in a kind of vivid and contemporary way aspects of Rome and um, bring Rome alive. And uh, that's in Bruno's shadow. Bruno refers to the statue of Giordano Bruno that's in the uh, Campo di Fiori. Uh, he was... Um, he was, I think, a, a Benedictine. He was, uh, he he left. He left the order. He was imprisoned. Um, he had some beliefs that were heretical. Hmm. Uh, one of them was that uh, the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, and you know, I, I, I think Galileo had some of those similar ideas. But Gal Galileo recanted and wasn't killed. Bruno hmm. didn't. Uh, Bruno was brutally killed, hung upside down. Um, and burned to death. But Bruno believed that uh, um, an infinite God, an infinite loving God created us. And given the idea that earth was not the center, that there were an infinite universe and an infinite number of suns, wouldn't it make sense that there were an infinite number of planets around those suns? And wouldn't it make sense that there were other God-created beings? This is heresy. Yeah, God-created so. beings. It's heresy now to some people. <laughs> exactly. Though, though, some, though, there's, though there's channels on TV that keep saying it's true. So he, he they, oh, that, so the cover, the cover is that famous picture um, of, um, this is the Flammarion engraving uh, that had nothing to really to do with uh, Bruno himself. But was used when um, the PBS stations began to do science, um, do science articles about about the uh, uh, Bruno and the astrology. This shows a man putting poking his head basically through the through the atmosphere, looking at the machinations of the heavens. Um, so I tried to bring I tried to bring that aspect um, into the into the novel as well. So um, I, have you been back to Italy, you know, many times? I mean, how many times? Have yeah, you I was able to, I was able to go to Rome at least five times. Oh, nice. Um, and I was there in 2004. Uh, the book may, essentially begins on the morning, December 26, 2004, the morning of the South Asian tsunami. And the Pope died the following April. So I thought that was a perfect time to set the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and I took lots of notes and I went back and I went back. Um, some of my early books were about Chicago and um, there's a little, oh, there's also a North Sider in the book and a South Sider in the book. Uh, there's a little <laughs> bit of Chicago in every, everything I write. Well, um, that, that makes sense. Uh, that's kind of, kind of your thing, I guess. Right. Yeah. Well, you write what you know. Yes. Yes. Okay? You write what you know. So um uh, one of the characters, uh, she lives on the south side, uh, and her father, um, her father uh, owns a bar, and they live upstairs. So I was able to write about a, a typical Chicago bar. Uh, at the time, uh, on the walls are pictures of uh, the Saints, John F. Kennedy and Mayor Richard J. Daley. The TV's <laughs> in the corner, and they're watching. You know, they're watching the. Uh, the Cubs game or the White Sox game or the Bears or the Bulls. Um, 
you know, the men are at the bar, you know, and the daughter, the daughters, one of the daughters' jobs is to empty the ashtrays and and to work in the bar. So um when you've got uh, when you've got access to information like that, details like that, of course, um, you know, it, it's an invitation to use them, to use them in work. Um I like I very much like Chicago and um um and now it's become a, a kind of habit. There's a there's some Chicago, even though I live now live in Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Um I go back periodically. Um and uh I'm I'm uh, I'm amazed at the changes, but I'm also very happy to see that some things just simply haven't changed. Uh, yeah, I have. I used to go. Um, I used to go to Chicago like uh, six times a year for like a week. Yeah. So you know, for several years. So I got to know pretty well, and it was a great walking town, great restaurant town, um, and uh, you know, easy easy to get around and, and find your way around. I used to I used to stay uh, like on uh, State Street, and then then walk over to we were by the river. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by this by Union Station, so it was a you know maybe a mile walk, but it was always it was always a nice walk. Um, so you, I'm intrigued uh, because I, I read a great book just recently and interviewed Carlo Trevisi, who uh, Treviso, who uh, who mm -hmm. wrote about um, Sicily in you know 1250. Yeah. Um, so you know whether somebody wants to write for themselves or. Um, you know, write their personal experiences, their family experiences, or wants to write a fiction book. I'm in, I'm in awe of people who write fiction because building characters and all of that. So what kind of advice do you have for people who want to maybe just, you know, write their family history? I would say start. And um, I think that most people who have success with a project schedule time and then, and, don't just start it and then abandon it. Um, I like to work on a schedule. Um, five, five days a week for a couple of hours. And don't worry about making it perfect. Uh, when I taught, I taught creative writing. Um, I had a position at Indiana University. Um, and when I, when I talked to my writers, I would tell them a story. And I said, I would say, there was one summer when I got a job as a janitor. And let me tell you how we started. We went into a corner of the room and we had tiles and we counted out nine tiles in the corner and then we swept them and then we washed them and then we waxed them. Oh, we let, the, we let it dry and then we waxed them and then we buffed them. Then we moved on to the next nine and they would like, look at me. And I would say, of course, I'm lying, but I'm talking about the way that you often try to write. You try to make it perfect from the beginning. No, what we would do is we'd clear the, we'd clear the furniture. Then we'd sweep the room. And this is true. Then, then we'd wash the floor. And while, while it dried, we did the next one. Mm -hmm. Then we'd wax it. And while it then... And I often was the guy with the with the machine, with the buffing machine. So, you know, you don't do everything at once. I think a lot of people, they try to be too perfect. And then, you know, um, they don't get it right. How do you learn how to play the piano? What if they said hit only the right notes? I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do anything. But people do that with, with writing. They freeze. So the, the. The best advice I would give is do it on a regular basis if you're serious about it. And don't, don't beat yourself up. Three days a week, two days a week, five days a week, whatever fits into your schedule, sometimes at night. And don't be perfect. Make mistakes. Just get the, get the black on the white. Get the ink on the page. And, you know, and then after a while, you'll get a little momentum. And then you'll, oh. After a while, you're, you'll get into the idea, and during the day, you'll have ideas of what to put down. Then jot it on a note, stick it in your pocket the next day, you know. Um, then, you know, you get a little bit more. Yeah, I, you know, and I wrote, 
when I wrote the first book about you know my research and my family yeah. and and uh, you know the ancestors going back you know like a you know thousand years or something like that, I, I changed direction like five times on that one. Yeah, because I I kept and maybe that's that's what you're saying because I kept trying to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> and and I couldn't, you know. So I kept I kept changing it, and then eventually I, you know, I found out where I I wanted to be with it and, and go from there. The second one that just came out was about my my life in banking and my experiences there, and uh, that was easier because I didn't have to research; it was all in my head, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't have to do all kinds of footnotes and things like that. Uh, and I really really like to try a fiction book. But I don't know how to build a character. And I think that's that may be not just me, but other people too. You know, if you want to write a fiction or I'd like to do a historical fiction about my family. Uh, but I'm stuck on how do I start to build a character? How do you build a character? Well, one, I would say, first off, there's no right way and wrong way. Whatever works, works. Okay. And so your reference with that first book, uh, I think that probably was the, what exactly what you were supposed to do. Mm. Um, just don't try to make it perfect. To, you can't, you know, you don't, you can't frosting the cake until it's cooked. So if you don't, you know, we don't worry about that. And building a character, um, there's drafts, draft by drafts. You might give a sketch. You can just write down, he's a kind, he's a kind character, uh, but he's, uh, he doesn't like dogs. And, and then later you could write, you know, you could ask some stuff and then you'll, you'll refine it, but just get some details down. Um, I would say that it's incremental. It's bit by bit. Um, what you might do and what I would have, what student, what teachers had me do is they would assign a short story for me to write, to copy someone else's short story, word for word. And I can remember being told I needed to write out a short story by James Joyce, the famous Irish writer. One of his stories was called Counterparts. And I had to hand write it. Hmm. And I thought, what is this? This is like what the nuns did in grammar school when I was bad. You know, I must not throw spitballs <laughs> in class. And I would have, you know, right. But when by writing it, it taught me the the language i would say that it would probably be similar if 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 you were teaching a young mus musician say a trumpet player to learn and imitate exactly and then you give them say something by uh by louis armstrong and then they have to they have to try to play it to learn that to learn to, to go through to, to go through that motion so that's that's something that you can do um, there's a bunch of books that are that are out. One of the ones that I very much like is Bird by Bird um, by Anne Lamott. Um, she tells the story that uh, um, her brother was the type who would procrastinate and he had to do a research project on birds. And the night before the project was done, he was sitting at the table, with stacks of books about birds. And he said, how am I ever going to do this? And his father came by and put a hand on the boy's shoulder and said, bird by bird, son, bird by bird. <laughs> and I mean, and that's, that's, that's writing. That's it. Just get it down. And if it doesn't, and if, and if, and if you're stuck, then go somewhere else. You know, it's only a, you know, right. It's, uh, I, I talk to my students. I try to use a lot of metaphors. Uh, you know, how do you clean the house? You're going to you're gonna get nowhere if you start to dust and then say, oh, my God, I have to vacuum. Oh, my God, look at those dishes. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I have to take out the garbage. No. Just do one thing at a time. You know, if you want to dust and dust a little bit. Um, it'll. Uh, the important thing is, to, is to, to put in your time and not beat yourself up and try to enjoy it um yeah and that's you know that's fine that's kind of the conclusion i came to and yeah and um you know there were times you know I, to your point i tried to stay on a, a certain schedule i i found like for yeah. me it was i don't know why it was like three o'clock in the afternoon for a couple hours you know uh but you know to you and then and then there were times where i just 
I had to stop for a while. I had to walk yeah. away for a month, you know, and come back and look at it again. And and I, you know the the hardest part of the whole thing uh, was editing it. And uh, I yeah. I I was published by Janaway and uh, great person there, Sandra Skidmore. You know, she said. You're never going to catch every typo. <laughs> she right. said, do the best you can. She says, I'll do the best I can. But believe me, you're never going to catch them all. There's always going to yeah. be something yeah. in there. Because that was making me nuts. Every time I went back, I would see another typo. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> and you know, well, and one of the things I did was I got, uh, which helped a lot. I got, um, it was a, a an app called Ghost Reader. Mm -hmm. So I could put it in there and it would read it back to me. And I was amazed at how many things because when you look at the page, you're seeing what you think you're supposed to see. But when you hear it, you hear the mistake. Yeah. Yeah, that's a wonderful that's a wonderful thing. And I think that there's again, there's no rules. And I would say that you did exactly what you needed to do. Um, I'm reading a book um by another Chicago writer, Christina Morocco. Uh she lives he, uh she teaches at uh, uh Elgin Community College. Uh, the book is called Adio Love Monster. And in the introduction, um, and uh, she mentions that her husband read to her every chapter. Mm. What a gift. And it, it's a beautiful book. It's about an Italian family in a, set in the 1950s um, uh, in, in, a, in a suburb. She calls it Mulberry, um, but a, 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 a fictional suburb of Chicago. Um, and a street with a with a family, an extended family that that lives there, among other among other people, some several non Italians. Um, and I thought, oh, it, it it is what a what a what a wonderful way to be able to revise your work uh, to have someone else read it and read it out, out loud to you, because then then you can you can hear it and do exactly what what you've done. Yeah, yeah, like I said, it, it made a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, so before we go, uh, give us the the name of the, the book again and uh, where people go buy it. And, and I know you also have a website too, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the book is called In Bruno's Shadow. And um, it's available certainly, oh, I would say, gosh, um, support your local bookstore. And there are ways that you can um, avoid uh, but of course, it, of course, there's Amazon, Amazon.com, um, and and um, the website. Do you, if you have don't have the address, I know that when you list them, you have the address. Um, the address is simply www.tonyartizoni.com. Um, I always know. I always know who's a friend. When back in the days when we we would receive phone calls. Uh, I always knew that it was a sales pitch when people would stumble over, <laughs> stumble over the last name or mispronounce it. Um, but I hope it's a book. I hope it's a book that people would like. Um, and I don't want to confuse people too much, but another book is um, called In the Garden of Papa Santuzzo. And this was a book that I wrote about. Um, I uh, make believe I, I made up, invented a family that lives in Gurgenti. And one by one, uh, the father and his wife, Adriana, send their children to the Americas. Um, oh. So it's a book about the, the movement of, uh, of Italians or specifically Sicilians uh, to the Americas. Um, but this, this is the book, but this is the book right now um, that, that, that was recently released. And one that I hope that, I hope that people, um, will read and I hope that people will enjoy. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Uh, well, listen, Tony, thanks again. I really appreciate you taking the time. It was, it's been totally my pleasure. Thank you so Hi. much for giving me that time. Hi everyone. This is Bob Sorrentino. Just letting you know that my new book farmers and nobles is now available for sale on www.italiangenealogy.blog backslash farmers and nobles or you can find the link in the podcast notes. Thanks for listening.